Hello everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA Podcast, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. I am your host, Robert Winfrey. I'm going to be flying solo for the next couple of weeks. Jeff Harris is busy at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con, so we wish him the best. Hopefully he you know, enjoys himself, hopefully nothing terrible happens. Hopefully he avoids con crud, because that's a terrible thing. And he should be back in a couple of weeks. So, again, then just as a fair warning, you're stuck with just me at the moment. I can avoid hitting my microphone. All right, on the agenda this evening, we have a review of last night's UFC on ESPN Plus 13. What a terrible card that was. I mean, we'll get into the specifics, but... Man, I thought that event sucked. <laughs> just straight up. Uh, we'll also have a preview for UFC on ESPN 4? Or if it's 3 or 4. Yeah, 4. Which is basically going to be subtitled when heavyweights happen, when heavyweight fights happen to good cards and how you can avoid it in the future because yeesh. There's 3 of them. There's freaking 3 of them. And none of them are good. <laughs> Just none of them. Oh, God, it's going to be painful. All right. So there's that, and then, of course, any major news. I don't think there's been a tremendous amount of news over the last little bit, but I will be sure to double-check everything and make sure that, you know, all that good stuff is locked and ready to go for you people. All right, let's start with the UFC on ESPN plus 13. Ugh. Ugh. I, I'm going to start off with this before I get into any of the specific fights. I didn't. I tried very hard not to complain too much about this event in my live coverage because I wasn't sure the degree to which it was an actual, like, objective issue that could be pointed out, like a string of bad fights or a, a badly paced event or any number of technical or just kind of real you know, observable issues versus just my experience with it. Because, look, you don't care. I assume you don't care about my feelings on the matter. I don't, quite frankly, care all that much about yours, so I assume it's reciprocal. And I know that sounds a little bit overly callous and terrible, but your personal experience is your personal experience. Feel free to share, but I know some of you do, and you guys, you know, we talk about some of this stuff if you follow along live, and couple of you on Twitter happen to follow me and keep me company there, and I, I deeply appreciate that. So uh, let me just say, when I say I don't care about your feelings, I acknowledge your personal enjoyment or lack of enjoyment about any fight, any card, etc. And I certainly am not saying that it doesn't matter in your life. It clearly matters. You're taking time to watch this event, You're and I, you're t most certainly taking time to express that in my general vicinity. So it's not like it's absolutely nothing, but... Your enjoyment or lack thereof has no bearing on my enjoyment or lack thereof. And again, the same is true of mine. Like, if, if I have a great time watching a series of fights and your response is, boy, that sucked, fair play. I'm not here to tell you you're right or wrong. But that's what I mean when I say, you know, you don't care. You, it, my enjoyment has no impact on your enjoyment by and large. There's a few kind of, there's a certain degree of reciprocal feedback that can be used to enhance that one way or the other, but again, by and large. So kind of work with me here. And it's just, again, it's your enjoy, and so I try not to, again, you're going to get a bit of my perspective on things because I'm the one writing these things, but I try very hard not to go into depth about my purely subjective, emotional, personal reaction to a bunch of stuff. If I complain about something related to an event, especially, like, again, in my official coverage, I try to make sure that it is, again, documented. It's, boy, these last three fights have really sucked. Because that's happened. It's, boy, this event is taking forever and the pacing is bad. That happens. Because these are, again, they're, it's very easy to look at, to look at those, to document, to verify, that kind of stuff. And I feel that's valid, because... It's pertaining to the objective nature of the event. 
My personal enjoyment is affected by a lot of things that have no bearing on anything in some respects. Some of it's my personal taste, some of it's crap that's going on in my life, some of it's whatever. And I just, I don't feel the need to burden a lot of people with me whining about my my feelings, my emotional reaction, whatever. Occasionally, again, it does slip in on occasion, but I try to make, I try to maintain a degree of reaction to purely the objective versus, again, burdening you with my subjective fandom of one fighter or the other or stuff of that nature. So the fact that I thought last night's event sucked, I wasn't sure how much of it was objective and how much of it was just me. So I didn't go on about how the event sucked in uh, live, but I've had a bit of time to think on it and to see some other people's reactions. And I think just on balance, probably with a degree, uh, uh, I don't know how sophisticated it would be, but with a fair degree of accuracy, just not a very good event. Uh, you had a lot of decisions. You had a couple of dubious stoppages. And you had a deep, which led to a deeply anticlimactic main event. And unless you're a really big fan of Uriah Faber, the, I don't think there was anything all that interesting in the co-main event either. And listeners of this show will know, as far as my fandoms go, not a fan. So it's... Uh, again, I, I just I didn't want it to be... You know, just how much of this is me whining about things not going the way I wanted them to go. Wah. Because you don't care about that. And I shouldn't care as much as I do, so... Trying to cut back on that. But I've seen a lot of other reactions to it that... Again, I think there's going to be a bit of rose-colored glasses, especially given Faber's win. That's going to kind of crop up. But if you took that whole event in... Um... Yeah. I... I just... No. Not very good. I... I don't think... Like, outside of, I think, one of the knockouts, that might be the only thing of, like, somewhat... Not. There wasn't any... There wasn't any really good fights in terms of, you know, fight of the night kind of thing. There was no fight of the night bo- uh, post-fight bonus awarded. Uh, the top three fights all ended with first-round finishes, which... I'm not complaining about. That happens. But it was just... I don't know. Uh, again, the whole event... Not a good event. It moved at a very, very fast pace. I mean, I've complained about long pacing of events before because it's happened and it sucks. This one almost might have gone a little bit in the opposite direction, a hair, a bit too far. I think from start to finish, from sign on to sign off, this event was five hours. It was less than five and a half hours, I'm pretty sure. And again, a bevy of first-round finishes over your last three fights will do a little bit of that. But there was a lot of, especially on the prelims, just banging fights out. You didn't have a lot of time to breathe and digest things. And I'm not sure where the perfect balance is. I'm re- so I don't want this to come across as how, as how dare they. Like Any event that goes really long and has three commercial breaks between fights, I think we can all agree, okay, that sucks. Do better. Moving quickly is not in and of itself a bad thing, especially with some of the, again, how some of these events are paced. I do think that if you're going to move them as, fa- trying to move as fast as they did, especially last night, you could have cut two fights and kept the same kind of general, kept the same time frame and given a few things a chance to breathe. In, but there was a lot of just set him up, knock him down, set him up, knock him down, set him up, knock him down, really, really, really fast. And maybe it's just me, but I, th- I think they might have overcorrected a little bit in terms of event pacing. Could be wrong. Maybe you disagree. That's just my perspective on it. So take it for whatever it's worth. Which is probably very little, but there it is. So there's that. Uh, just not a very good event. 
Uh, in your main of the main event fight, uh, Jermaine Duran to me defeats Aspen Ladd via TKO 16 seconds into the first round. A um, little bit difficult to unpack this one in some respects. I wasn't in love with the stoppage. Um, Je- I asked Jeff if he had any thoughts he'd like read on the air. Jeff had no real issues with the stoppage of this fight, and fair play. I'm. I can get kind of what Herb Dean, why he stopped it as early as he did, because, look, Aspen Ladd just kind of walks into a right cross, gets dropped onto her kind of knees and elbows, and I, th- she just did not look all the way there. After that punch. Now, that doesn't mean she was unconscious. Because she wasn't. But, again, I can see why Herb Dean stopped it. Not the best stoppage. Uh, and I think if Jermaine Durandamy's follow-up left, because she, she throws this left as Ladd is kind of on her knees, that doesn't hit her in the face. It kind of winds up more as a clubbing blow to the chest that kind of knocks her over backwards. If that punch had landed clean and dropped her back like that, I don't think we'd be having this conversation as far as you're debating the stoppage. I think that would have pretty clearly been okay. She was wobble she was hurt badly by that punch. And then this follow up just really rocks her world. We're done here. And I, I think again, I don't think that we'd be debating it. I really don't. But she missed, and so we're left kind of with the reality that the stoppage was I don't want to say bad because I don't think it was bad in the traditional sense of the word I just I don't think it was all that great and again with stoppages it's a spectrum you have great stoppages that are perfectly on point you have terrible stoppages where you know no one under I suppose I should rephrase this. You have fights that are stopped way too early. And you have fights that are stopped way too late. We've all seen examples of both of those. And you don't want to go too far to one side or the other. So, And if anything, you do want to err on the side of stopping it a little bit early because we're talking about people taking tremendous amounts of physical damage. So I'm I'm okay with it. It, again, not the worst stoppage I've ever seen. And I understand, again, I understand where the referee was coming from. It was Herb Dean in this case. But, again, was it, you know, great? No, probably not a great stoppage. Um, that said, oh man, I wonder the degree to which something like this was inevitable given how bad Aspen Ladd's weight cut was. Uh, you can find the video of this online. Um, her weigh-in was... She looked awful. Um, she badly managed that weight cut. I don't think she's the... I don't think she has the body type for 145. But she needs to get a handle on her weight cut. Because... That was bad. I mean, if you've seen... If you watch her... Again, watch her way in the videos online. That's hard to watch. And I've got a pretty stiff... I've got a stiff constitution, guys. I am not put off by a lot. And that was... That was pretty rough. Uh, also, I have to say this because I was watching that way in video. And why are you people at, in California using, like, analog scales? It's ridiculous. Stop it. We have the technology. Digital scales are superior. Keep an analog for backup as far as you know, catastrophic failure or the inability to properly calibrate every digital scale in a five-mile radius. But, I mean, look, again, Aspen Lad, when she weighs in, is uh, she's shaking. She's barely able to stand kind of thing. It's, it's ugh, again, it's a, she had a terrible weight cut. But she's shaking as she's standing on the scale, and when you have one of those you know, old weight scales, that makes it shake, it makes it bounce. She was on that thing longer than she needed to be because she couldn't physically stand still to get long enough to get an accurate reading. Digital scale. It'll help with that tremendously. It's more accurate. 
Also gives the commission less room to be, uh, you know, influenced by the UFC to one degree or another. And I've said this in the past. I'm not entirely sure the degree to which every weight cut, if you go way back in the day, was all that, especially when they had, you know, kind of very public weigh-ins. How many of those are as legitimate as they could be? Especially when you're dealing with, again, the oldest weight-based scale system. Because, and I, I've said this, you really think any of those commissioners were going to announce, you know, Chuck Liddell as being anything other than 205 when he was fighting for the belt? I mean, in all seriousness. Like, if he badly missed weight, then sure. But I really do wonder if, he, again, and this is just a purely intellectual exercise, if you put him on a digital scale a contemporary digital scale, how many times is he, you know, 205.7? And just, all right, we announced it as 205 because that's the way things are done. And maybe, you know, rounding is different from commission to commission. Again, it's a whole thing, but I'm a, I'm a big believer in the value of, again, the non-digit, of having the knowledge and the ability to utilize non-technological based systems when necessary, I'm also a firm believer that we have the technology, we have bettered ourselves and the world with it, let's use it, yeah? So, Jermaine Durand, to me again, whether you, again, I'm not in love with the stoppage, but I can't fault, you know, Jermaine Durand to me, she did what she was supposed to do. Like, what do you want to, I mean, I mean this in all seriousness, like, if she kept hitting after the referee pulled her off, again, That's just, she actually obeyed the rules this time, so, you know, fair play. I mean, look, Jermaine Durandamy is a very, very tough fighter. Her last loss in MMA was in 2013 against Amanda Nunes. She hasn't been the most active fighter since then for a variety of reasons. But since then, I mean, she beat a couple of meh opponents. Then she beat Holly, whether you agree with the decision or not, and I don't, but she did. Beats up Raquel Pennington, badly. Beats Aspen Ladd. I believe she came into this fight ranked as the number one contender. Uh, I imagine if Nunes is going to defend the bantamweight title, and not just, you know, defend featherweight and then call it a career, it's, that's, she's the next most viable contender. I don't expect this fight, that fight to go Tremaine's way, but... Because, again, the man... Oh, God. Nunez is just a beast. But I think if she's going to get... And I, I I also don't know how much the UFC can trust her in a title fight, considering the last time they had her in one. She fought a... The fight wasn't all that great. She cheated a couple of times from a documented perspective. Eh, cheated might be a little bit harsh, but... She exploited gray areas of the rules, and some that were less gray and more black and white kind of thing. Then immediately said, no, I will not fight the literal only other quasi competitive the only other person in this division, and was stripped of the belt. I mean, I, I don't know if the UFC is ever going to put her in a title fight again, because it went so badly the last time. But if they are, and again, I don't really care for her chances against Amanda Nunes, but Jermaine's a very good striker, and if Amanda decides she's going to spend the entire time striking with her, that does give Jermaine avenues to victory. Of course, I I don't expect... I expect Nunes to be a very intelligent fighter about that and kind of go, okay, striking, I might be able to win here, but I have this dominant advantage if I can get things to the mat, so down we go, and I'll just pound her out on the ground again. Uh, that's, so yeah, at, look, Aspen Lad, still one of the, still a bright prospect as far as the, uh, you know, the state of bantamweight goes, but this was a step up in competition for her. This was a pretty serious step up, actually. I mean, she went from, a she went from Sajara Eubanks to Jermaine Durandamy. That was a pretty big step. I, I've... Let's see. I imagine she'll come back stronger from this. Again, if she gets her weight cut in line, and if she... 
again, she's very young. This was only her ninth professional fight. She's 24, for crying out loud. I expect her to come back and to continue to be a relevant force in the division, but... And, you know, every fighter hits these setbacks, so if she can learn from it and come back stronger, she can still be a force. If this, you know, completely shatters part of her confidence and mentality, maybe, you know, maybe not so much, but... I tend to err on the side of... Given the totality of circumstance, she'll be back and she'll be strong when she'll be strong when she fights again. Uh, in your co-main event, Uriah Faber defeats Ricky Simone via TKO, 46 seconds in the first round. This was Uriah Faber's comeback from retirement. This was the fastest finish of his career. This was his first TKO win via punches. Well, since like 2003 look this up because uh, there was doctors uh, yes four excuse me since 2004 how would they just how would they hang on that's not entirely accurate how were they defining that because he had a doctor stoppage he had a few others Yet again, there's a few doctor stoppages on here. We're, that's weird. Might be since 2007. Hmm. I need to double check this guy's nickname. Yeah, okay, so since 07. I, still, 12 years. Long time. A uh, lot of credit goes to Jack Slack on this one, who very accurately predicted that Ricky Simone is very susceptible to a right hand, especially early in a fight until he kind of gets your timing. I mean, frickin' Ronnie Yaya cracked him a few times with a right hand. And Ronnie Yaya's striking credentials are, like, non-existent. Um, and, you know, Faber, not a great striker, but has the... Has has some power, and ugh, this was such a brain dead fight from Simone in that closing sequence. I mean, he opens up with his usual aggression, uh, just all over Faber. Lands a pretty good left hook that wobbles him. Faber's chin is not at all what it used to be. Kind of off balances him with a left hook, just gets overzealous chasing him, and gets caught with a right, and Faber's able to pound him out. Look, Uriah Faber is a one-trick pony when it comes to striking. He doesn't really use his left hand for anything. It paws every now and then. It kind of deflects. He might throw a bit of a jab on occasion. But it's not really a threat or a danger. His danger is in the right hand. And he doesn't even have a variety of setups for it. He doesn't throw it all that straight. He tends to throw the traditional overhand. He doesn't throw a clean hook. Not much for the uppercut. Again, as time goes on, I think he does. If he really gets it going in a fight, he will throw the uppercut on occasion. If he, again, I think when he fought Mike Brown, he was able to use a few of them. I'd have to go back through some of his fight catalog. But it's... Just not... Again, it's not all that consistent a weapon. Not all that varied a weapon. And Simone just... I don't know if he completely disregarded it. I don't know if he thought he had different timing. I I don't know. But gets cracked, dropped, finished. And... Again, if you're a Uriah Faber fan, this was a great feel-good moment. Uh, Guy comes out of retirement, 40 years old, and stops a young... I mean, Simone's 20-something, was ranked number 15, uh, off the back of the win over Ronnie Yaya. Uh, so on the one hand, again, a feel-good moment in that respect. On the other, I cannot stand what's going to happen next. Because let me tell you all what's going to happen next. Here's, here's your bit of pessimistic story time. The UFC is going to force Uriah Faber back into the title scene 
and we're going to get Faber versus Cejudo. And I will... I mean, for, I, I think Jeff was... I think Jeff's exact words were, he will be disgusted if that happens. But that's what's going to happen. I don't think the UFC has any idea what to do with the sub-155 weight classes unless Team Alpha Male is figured prominently in the discussion. I just don't. I mean, when Joe's... They struggled to really kind of get along with Aldo. And some of that's on Aldo. I'm not... He's not a saint (laughs) in this situation. But some of that... Some of that's on the UFC, too. And they kind of put Mendez in, you know, the top position a few times, and then they kind of lucked, I don't want to say lucked, but McGregor came along and became a giant megastar. Then McGregor left. And then uh, that kind of Frankie Edgar in there as well, and Edgar transitioning from, you know, the lightweight division and some of the goodwill he had with the UFC and the fan base helped a bit. Then, you know, but Aldo goes back and wins. Max Holloway comes along. I mean, look at what Dana White was saying after Max Holloway started. Win- you know, look at what a look at what Max had to do to actually fight for the stupid belt. Look at that win streak. That's ridiculous. That he had to do all of that to even fight for. I think he fought for just to get to an interim title fight with Pettis, if memory serves, before he fighting Aldo twice. I mean, again, that that's insane. I would almost guarantee you that if he had some loose association in some way or another with that group, he'd have been there two fights sooner. I would, I would bet money. I would darn, I would bet money on that. Not my mortgage, but money. And then you know, Holloway keeps, you know, winning, and the UFC's position becomes, boy, he should move up in weight. And. Uh, I mean, he might still, again, Max is... I've said this, I've talked about this before. If Max is going to move up to lightweight, he's got to leave featherweight behind because he's going to have to put on a fair bit of some muscle mass to help him compete against some of the style and some of the big guys at lightweight. And he's going to have to do some stuff to kind of increase his punching power a little bit. Because there's some, there's some crackers at lightweight. But uh, I, I almost feel like, especially in the wake of last night, we'll get into some of this more in a bit, that the UFC like wants Holloway to move up, <laughs> wants Brian Ortega to think about moving up so they can have Josh Emmett fight for the belt. Uh, because he's a Team Alpha Male guy. It's. Uh... I mean, if you look at... Ban- and Sorry, that's just featherweight. Now, if you look at bantamweight, now some of this was some of the history of the bantamweight division being a bit centered around Team Alpha Male is deserved because the best fighters were in that place. Again, it comes in and it's Cruz and Cruz's rivalry rivalry, with Faber. And yeah, the UFC kind of hot-shotted him into one of those title shots, but, well, his first one against Faber, but all right, fair enough. Cruz wins. Cruz gets injured. Cruz falls out. And then it's Henan Burrell... And it very rapidly becomes T.J. Dillashaw, and fair fair play to T.J., Uh, you know, was the best bantamweight in the world for a period of time, but a Team Alpha Male guy. Uh, He breaks from Team Alpha Male, Cruz comes back, Cruz wins, and then it's Cruz and Faber again, rather than Cruz and a deserving contender. Cruz wins, now it's Cruz and Cody Garbrandt, instead of Cruz and one of the guys ranked above Garbrandt. There were a few of them who are slightly more deserving. Full credit to Garbrandt, turns in one of the most glorious performances I've ever seen. Then it's Cruz and TJ. Now, or then it's Garbrandt and TJ, excuse me. Now, that was a bit of a judgment call by the UFC. I think there were a couple of other options instead of going back to TJ Dillashaw, but it was a reasonable judgment call. TJ wins. Clean stoppage in the second round. Rather than TJ fighting, I think Marlon Moraes was on his streak at that point in time. Part of it. So rather than fighting Moraes, or a rematch with Rafael Asensau, or I think Sterling had just lost. There was somebody else in that orbit. 
There were three other guys. Immediate rematch with Cody Garbrandt because Team Alpha Male BS. Uh, Dillashaw knocks him out clean in the first round this time. Then Dillashaw, rather than actually defend the belt, goes down and gets smoked by Henry Cejudo and then fails a drug test and is now suspended. So Cejudo goes up, beats Marlon Moraes. Cejudo is now the champion, out for the rest of the year, more or less. But rather than... Because the UFC has a few deserving... I mean, look, Henry Cejudo has at least four deserving contenders. Well... Let's call it three, for the record. Let's just call it three, because you have Joseph Benavidez at flyweight. Again, the UFC's not actually keeping the division. They're wasting everyone's time. But if that belt's ever going to be defended again, it's Benavidez. Then you get to bantamweight, and you have Aljamain Sterling as your pretty clear-cut number one contender. Uh, below him... <sighs> You've got, you know, you've got Austin Sal, who is in the mix, despite you know the loss to Morais. I think Austin Sal's got a fight coming up, so that might change, but he's in the mix. You have Peter Yan, who's been tearing things up. And but if you look at again the top several guys there, there's not a Team Alpha male guy to be found until you get to number seven, where when it's Cody Garbrandt who can't stop getting knocked out. <laughs> so there's no one. In the again, there's no one in the top ten. If you get further down, you have Song Yudong who trains out of there, and then Faber is going to feature somewhere in that rankings. And the UFC is going to force it is going to force it to Faber. They're going to jump over. Again, at three or so deserving bantamweights and a deserving flyweight in favor of Team Alpha Male BS. It uh, and it is profoundly annoying, and uh, I really hope there's a giant revolt if they do this. I really do. You have so many guys that are getting that are gonna get screwed over by that decision, and Cejudo wants it because it's a relatively easy fight that will be the highest profile thing he can achieve. Faber wants it because he still thinks he can be a champion and. I imagine if he never becomes UFC champion, that will annoy him until he dies. So they're going to shoehorn that in, and I will be absolutely disgusted. I'm with Jeff. I will be disgusted. That is, that is absolutely a shameless act of... And look, different people have different tolerances for how much of the old sports entertainment they want in the UFC. Some people like more, some people don't like more. Some people hate it unless it comes from one of, like, three fighters, in which case, yay! Some people like it unless it's coming from one of two or three fighters, in which case, boo! And you know what, again, you guys do you. Fair enough. I'm not here to knock on any of that. So there might be some people out there who think, you know what, yeah, Faber Cejudo, that's a great idea. I don't know any of them. I don't imagine it's any of you listening to this. I might be wrong. Some of you might be expressing extreme displeasure with my perspective on this. And again, fair play. I just know. Not only... like My interest in that is not just zero, it's actually negative. That would actively dissuade me from watching the event it takes place on. But that's the direction they're going to go. I Again, I darn near bet money on it. Uh, there were some... I saw a bit of this from some of the media members uh, floating, you know, let's do Faber versus Sterling as a number one contenders match, and Sterling, Aljamain Sterling was like, um, no. You know, he's he's earned his shot. He really has. I mean, his only loss recently was to Morais, who knocked him stiff as a board with that knee strike. Thing of beauty. But he's won his fight since then. Uh, his last one was actually a watchable fight. <laughs> and, yeah, he's, again, he's not interested. 
and when you've done what he's I mean when you've done what he's done I don't blame him moreover I mean how do you come out of that looking good from a PR standpoint you know if again if you're Ricky Simone and you're young and there's some potential there but you're largely unproven at the elite level again big win over Ronnie Yaya not trying to downplay that at all because that was impressive but he's not consistent he's not you know proven at the elite level Young, hungry guy trying to make his name off of Faber is understandable, whereas I think Sterling has proven himself so consistently, by and large, at that level. I think even if he wins, he winds up losing in a lot of respects, because, I mean, A, his fight with Faber might just not be all that enjoyable from an aesthetic perspective. And... Two, if he's perceived as just beating up on an old man, and I know Faber's not old, old, but he's 40 at bantamweight. Uh, I mean, I I laugh every time you know the announcers say he's the California kid. He's the California middle-aged man. All right. He just is. He's 40. Sorry, <laughs> middle-aged. But so if Aljamain Sterling goes out there and just abuses him for three rounds. You know, there's not a lot of goodwill that's going to be built up for that. So, I mean, I think he's kind of right in just being generally averse to that fight. Moreover, I mean, again, it's not like Faber should be all that highly ranked. I don't even think they should put him in the top 15 if we look at the entire bantamweight division. There's probably a few other guys out there with stronger resumes than coming out of retirement in a multi-year layoff and beating Ricky Simone. Just going to throw that out there. I imagine those people exist in that division. It's a very good division. But that's also... Again, I expect Faber to be ranked, and I expect them to go, Yay, Faber title shot, because we don't know how to promote anybody less than 155 pounds unless there's a Team Alpha Male dramatic bit of BS involved, and I will vomit. Uh, All right, moving on. Josh Emmett defeated Mursad Bakhtich via TKO at 425 of the first round. A uh, solid enough win for Emmett. He found a pretty decent angle, uh, landed a jab that just off-balanced Bakhtich, and then he got on top of him and pounded him out. Uh, man, I was on the Mursad Bakhtich hype train for a bit. I don't know how many of you might remember that. Um, dude looked like a surefire top-level, possible title challenger. I, maybe even champion. I couldn't swear to that one, but... I mean, his debut against Chaz Skelly was a little bit so-so, but considering the level of opposition... Uh, then, you know, his next three fights, I mean, he put beatdowns on guys, and then he steps up to Darren Elkins and dominates that fight up until he gets head-kicked. And then that's where some of the issues kind of start. He stops fighting all that regularly. I know he's had some injury issues. And I don't know, man. Again, for a guy that four or five years ago, yeah, four years ago in like 2015, looked like a darn near can't miss title picture, guy in the title picture. Uh, I don't know what happened specifically, but. Uh, oof. the bloom is off that rose, I guess. And I'm not saying he can't still fight and win in the UFC because I think he can. He has a good skill set. He's a he's a talented guy, but I think there's a very real chance we have seen his ceiling, and it's significantly lower than a lot of us anticipated. Uh, I don't know what you do next with Emmett. He's, again, this is two in a row. It's two finishes in a row, but there's still a little bit of that kind of looming specter of what Jeremy Stevens did to him because that was ugly. But, uh, I mean, he's going to find himself probably in the title or, again, the UFC. I think I saw on Twitter, you know, we should just do Emmett and uh, Chan Sung Jung for their Korea card at the end of the year because they're going to be in Busan uh, for their last show of the year in December. You know, I'm down for that. I think that's a fight that makes sense. Uh, I could live with that. And, again, Emmett's going to find himself somewhere in that title orbit. Just by nature of his team association, 
And again, he's winning fights. Uh, he was losing the Johnson fight but up until he landed that punch, but he did ultimately win, and that is a pretty major consideration, so... Uh, you know, good for him. Uh, God, the rest of this card. All right, um, Carl Robertson defeated Wellington Terman via split decision, 29-28. Uh, I thought, I thought Terman won this fight. I scored it for him. I stand by that at the moment. Again, if I rewatch and really go over stuff with a fine tooth comb, maybe not, but I think I'm going to stand by that. Uh, Robertson very lucky with that decision. Marvin Vittori defeated Cesar Fajaya via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the board. Uh, solid performance from Vittori. He's... I mean, he's had an up-and-down UFC career in some respects because you know, he had the loss to Shoeface, Antonio Carlos Jr. He had the draw with Omar Yakhmedov. He had the loss to Israel Adesanya, but... There's very clearly a lot of the raw components you want in a successful fighter uh, present in him. And I think if he keeps if he's able to keep building, he's going to be somebody to kind of be reckoned with. Um John Allen defeated Mike Rodriguez via unanimous decision, 229-28, 130-27. I remember almost nothing about this fight. It wasn't all that good. It was crappy light heavyweights. Andre Feely defeated Shaman Marais via knockout in the first round. Uh, he uncorked the, I think I saw it referred to as the Robert Whitaker combo. The old uh, power hand cross into the head kick from the same side. Because Whitaker's used that on occasion. I think that's what he badly wobbled Jacare with in their fight. It's a good combo if you can pull it off. And it was a really nice counter combination from him onto Marais, so... You know, much as Feely is still... He's not exactly a 500 guy anymore. He's won a few more than he's lost, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean... I, I, I don't know how to say this. He's the, As good as this finish was, I'm still not sure that his ceiling isn't still the same thing. You know? I could be wrong. But I, I'm just that's still kind of the vibe I get. I mean, again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he steps up and he does better against a higher level of opposition this time. But I'd need to see that before I can really form a judgment. As for you know, he beat the guy who was put in front of him, and you know what? Fair play. A lot of guys don't. I mean, in fact, half of all fighters don't. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Juliana Pena defeated Nico Montano via unanimous decision, 229-28, 129-27. The 29-27 was dubious. Uh, Montano had a good first round, but this is just one of those fights where it was, hey, whoever's on top is winning. And in the first round, it was Montano. In rounds two and three, it was Pena. Uh, not any more complicated than that. Uh... Montano looked pretty decent up at bantamweight now, so I imagine she'll stick around. She, I don't think flyweight's all that feasible for her. She had weight cutting issues. Uh, I mean, that's what led to her not fighting Valentina Shevchenko and then getting stripped of the belt. And then, uh, just you know, you, you, again, she, it's not like she had. Again, I don't think the ten eight score was all that justified in this fight. So I'd like to see her try her hand in that weight class a few more times. Um, as for Pena, the UFC is really high on her, but uh, I mean, her striking is not good. Just, like, not good. And as kind of evidenced here, all of her grappling credentials, and you saw this in the Zingano fight, too. A fight she won, but uh, not great on bottom. And not the... She's got pretty good... She's able to stop some takedowns, but her takedown game is kind of predictable. I mean, Montano reversed a couple of hers, the same takedown, uh, just straight into side control on top. So... And, I mean, and she had the time off and she because she was pregnant. And she, you know, she's got a kid now, and you know, congratulations, that's a wonderful thing. 
But there's some pretty serious diversification refinement that needs to go on if she's really going to excel. Because, I again, I don't know how many of you guys might have come into the sport in the interim, but I remember how high the UFC was on her, uh, how much commentary was you know, really kind of on her side in any 50-50 position. And there was a lot of kind of, we want, they were kind of thinking, yay, she'll beat Valentina, and then she'll go on to fight for the belt, and the ultimate fighter will not be a giant waste of space anymore. And then Shevchenko armbarred her <laughs> clean. <laughs> and, you know, just, you know, Valentina Shevchenko's a badass, but... Uh, so, again, both women acquitted themselves well, considering the totality of their circumstance. Again, both were coming off a pretty serious layoff, so... Um, just, again, a very... How do I say this? This looked like, you know, the majority of women's MMA fights do. Um, Ryan Hall defeated Darren Elkins via unanimous decision, 229-28, 130-27... How Ryan Hall did not get a 10-8 in either the first or the second is a bit beyond me. Um, Elkins got dropped twice in the second round, and I don't think landed anything of value. Uh, um, Ryan Hall's an awkward guy. Just a really awkward guy to try and figure out. He kicks... I mean, he... <laughs> He dropped Elkins with a wheel kick. Oh, God, it was hilarious and glorious at the same time. Um, again, Hall's just tough to figure out. There's, people are terrified to engage with him on the ground. Some of that is warranted. Uh, they don't call the man the wizard for nothing. The, he is a phenomenal grappler. But a lot of that just straight up nope. Okay, fine. Don't let him go to the ground on his terms kind of thing. Okay. But the just flat-out refusal to engage at all is, in some respects, even more detri more detrimental to your game. As you're just, again, flatly refusing to engage in significant portions of where the fight could take place. Uh, he dropped Elkins with lefts, I think, in the second round, and then, oh, he had this beautiful sequence at the end of the second. Uh, I think he tried an Iminari roll. Uh, wound up kind of picking an ankle. Elkins spun through to avoid the knee bar of the heel hook, got on top. Uh, so he looked to kind of get on top and disengage. Hall comes up on, I think it was a single leg kind of position, gets the takedown into mount, locks up a triangle, rolls to his back, and if that round goes on for another five seconds, Darren Elkins is sleeping. Uh, he got saved by the bell there. It was a beautiful, beautiful scramble. Uh, you know, just beautiful. I, you may not be all that interested in this fight, but if you can find that sequence, that was glorious. Um, again, Ryan Hall is a, a wizard on the mat. I'm a little bit concerned about Darren Elkins' ability to take damage at this point. Ryan Hall, again, I'll, I'll give him a little bit of a pass on getting wheel kicked on the head and being wobbled. Like, there's just a lot of mass there and a lot of force. But he got off balanced and wobbled by some just lefts. And Ryan Hall's not a big puncher. Not a documentedly big puncher. Not a documented big puncher at any rate. Who knows? Could be hiding crushing knockout power that he just chooses not to use for punches. Um, I, f I don't think that's likely, though. He spent a lot of this fight, again, just not with his legs all the way under him, and I do at this point wonder about the accumulation of damage he's absorbed. Because he was getting... Some of it's just he's an awkward guy, and I get that. Some guys are just a little bit awkward, and their legs never look like they're quite right under them. I mean, Ovin St. Preux always looks like he's weird on the feet. But when you're getting pretty visibly shaken up by the punches of Ryan Hall, and I don't mean that to disparage Ryan Hall, because I like watching him fight. I really do. I think he's interesting. I, I think there might be some... Uh, some reevaluation of Darren Elkins' ability to take punishment that needs to be going on. 
Um, and again, some of, he gets away from a lot of it by just being willing to push through, force a clinch, and then cage wrestle for prolonged periods of time. And he wasn't willing to engage with that here at all. So anyone that can f- keep distance and force him to just fight striking... Uh, I mean, if, you, if you're if you a more adept, adept striker than Hall, there's a good chance you can finish him. Because Ryan Hall got him hurt badly, and Ryan Hall is... Well, not... Again, Ryan Hall's not a bad striker. I've seen bad strikers. I don't think that's Ryan Hall. But he is not... You know, th- that is not his primary skill set. And I think even, you know, if you were to talk... With, I think he'd probably even agree with that. Uh, so, Ryan Hall just continues to be an awkward guy to try and figure out. And... Again, the scores in this... I don't understand the purpose of changing the scoring criteria if they're not actually going to use it, because those first two rounds, one of them should have been a 10-8. I don't think Elkins did anything. I mean, anything. (laughs) Apart from get kicked in the head and dropped. Like, I don't get that. Um, Jonathan Martinez defeated uh, Liu Pingyuan with a knee three minutes, 54 seconds of the third round. Uh, this was a decent enough fight, but uh, Ping Yuan just kept circling the sa- literally always circling to his left, and um, whenever he'd engage, he really did tend to always duck his head to the same to the. He was orthodox here, so to hit to his right, and you want to get your head off the center line when you punch. You really do. I, I'm about I. Uh, I have a few kids that I kind of... Some kids that I work with at the karate studio I attend who I'm... Frankly, if I can just get them to tuck their chins instead of going upright whenever someone gets close in an engagement, I'll consider that... That would make me so happy if I could just get them to stop leaning back with their chins in the air, but... uh, Getting your head off the center line is next for... There's a few of them that are you know, are coming along more and I think it might be time to start okay, so when you punch move your head so you the opponent doesn't know where your head is kind of thing and you so you do want to get it off the center line but you also don't want to do it the sa- you don't want to be predictable with it if you do it the same way every time and your opponent gets a read on it, it's very easy to land a counter like this Martinez just read that motion and threw a just a stepping knee to the chin and Peng Yuan dropped like, you know, a puppet with the strings cut. Like, dump, done. Well, good knockout. So, credit to Martinez for that. Um, Brianna Van Buren defeated Livia Hanata Souza via unanimous decision. 30-27 across the board. Van Buren came out like a house on fire, man. Never really let Souza into the fight. And Souza might be a bit of a front runner, as far as that goes, because when she's winning, she's a buzzsaw. But I'm not sure she's been able to document... I'm not sure we've seen her overcome adversity. I might have to re... There's one of those fights, I think it was the Katya Konkampa uh, fight, that she might have overcome a little bit of adversity. also might be confusing that with uh, Konkampa's win over Stephanie Egging, but eh, I don't know. My, my memory of Invicta at that time is a little fuzzy in some respects. So, again, Brianna just never really let her into the fight, so good on her. And then kicking everything off, Benito Lopez won a unanimous decision against Vince Morales, 29-28 across the board. This was a terrible... I shouldn't say terrible. This was a bad decision. Um, I I know Lopez trains at Team Alpha Male now, and I think there might have been a little bit of shenanigans there. Um, I think giving him two rounds ignores a lot of what Morales was doing in, I think, the third in particular is kind of the swing round. Uh, I I mean, I saw a few people on Twitter had it 30-27 Morales, so I'm not sure I agree with it. I thought Lopez might have edged one of those rounds, but yeah, I uh, don't agree with that decision at all. Um, yeah, not a good one. All right, and that was UFC on ESPN Plus 13. Again, I just... 
I I don't know, man. I don't think I'm I'm in the stages of burnout as far as the sport goes. I I know what that feels like, and I've been burned out in the past. The way the UFC has structured itself, it is kind of designed to burn you out as a fan. And I consume a lot of it. So I, I don't think I'm in the, I'm dealing with burnout. I think this was just not a very good event. Um, I got done with this one and kind of went, boy, I need to do something else to kind of, for want of a better expression, get the taste out of my mouth, you know? Just did not come away from this event feeling all that good about stuff. <laughs> I, mean, I don't feel good about most things generally, so I'm not sure how, <laughs> how much of that I should put on the card, but that's not a that's not the way I come away from a lot of UFC events. I come away from some just kind of like, oh, thank heavens it's over. I can go do something else now. It's been seven hours. Kind of thing. Some become way energized. This one I just kind of went, ugh. I'd almost rather have done other stuff with my time. Kind of thing. So I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Maybe you all had a very different experience. Leave a comment. You know, wherever you happen to find this. Uh... You know, the MMA Zone of 411 Mania, uh, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Transistor, wherever. Uh, feel free to leave a comment if, again, if you had a very different experience with this card. I'm, I, I'm curious from a point of data collection, if nothing else, how much of an out, how much of a statistical outlier is my experience relative to other people's. So anyway, thanks to everyone who did read and follow along with that. There weren't a tremendous a tremendous number of you, but this was a... Again, this was not a good card. I don't blame anyone for skipping it. Uh, you know, at all. Uh, alright. But, there will be another UFC event next week. UFC on ESPN 4. The UFC is in... They're in San Antonio for this one, yes? Uh, yes they are. Nice. Um, this is a good main event. Your main event is Rafael Dos Anjos and Leon Edwards. This is a very relevant fight. Both men are ranked welterweights. Um, Dos Anjos is currently ranked number 4, and Edwards is number 11. Edwards should be higher. I mean, there's a there was some shake-up after Jorge Masvidal <laughs> uh, ruined Ben Askren's life <laughs> with that flying knee. Oh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, Masvidal is now number three. Dos Anjos drops to four. But because Askren dropped so far, Till Thompson, Pettis, and Ponzinibbio all moved up. And Damian Ma- yeah, Leon Edwards is tied with Damian Maia at number 11. And I would have Edwards above Robbie Lawler, I think. I mean, Leon Edwards is on a very long winning streak. That includes a couple of really good wins. I mean, his only definitive loss... Okay, he has two losses in the UFC. One was his debut to Claudio Silva. That was a split decision. And I think he maintains he won that. Then he got beat up by Kamaru Usman. And fair play, Kamaru Usman beats everyone up. Hadn't lost since then. And he's got some big wins in that re- in that time frame. He finished Albert Tumanov. Really surprised me. Beat Vicente Luque, beat Brian Barberina, beat Donald Cerrone, and I'm leaving out a few here. It's a much longer winning streak than that. And frankly, I thought the fact that he only beat Gunnar Nelson via split decision was a little bit bogus. He pretty clearly won that fight. Um, yeah, it was. I did not agree with that being split, if memory serves. So he's and he's on a big winning streak, and I would rank him above Robbie. Uh, so again, it's a relevant fight. It's a very good fight. It's two of the better clinch strikers in the certainly in the division, if not the sport more generally. Um, it's a tough one to pick too. They are both very talented guys. They're both well rounded. I think a lot of this might be dictated by who's going forward, not. Because mostly because when Rafael dos Anjos is going forward, what legitimately one of the best fighters in the world. I mean, if you watch his fights when he's the one exerting pressure, 
he's amazing. He's, he's generally amazing anyway. Dude is a significantly underappreciated all-time great fighter. I mean, I, I don't think he... I, I genuinely don't think he's going to get the credit he deserves as far as, like, all-time... You know, where, where people talk about all-time great fighters, because... Uh, he's he's tremendous. He's absolutely tremendous. But for some reason, he's overlooked. <sighs> but again, when he he's only that good when he's going forward. Going back, uh, Dos Anjos has a, a very different skill set. It's not nearly as good. He's still good. I mean, he can still you know beat the average UFC fighter and. 90% of the human population going backwards. But we're not talking about the vast majority of humanity, we're talking about the very... we're talking about the elite level. And it's the first time he's not fighting a guy who's going to wall install him in a while. I mean, look at his last fights. It was, what, Kevin Lee, Kamaru Usman, and Colby Covington. A lot of fence fighting in those fights. And you know, credit to him for winning the Lee fight. But I think we're finally going to get a bit more of his striking on display. And he's a good grappler, and he's a good striker. And Dos Andres is good everywhere. Keeps a crazy pace. Powerful kicks. I'm leaning towards Dos Andres, actually. <laughs> Might be foolish of me. But I think Edwards is going to have some success. I just think he's a little bit too... I think he will let Dos Anjos push forward. I, I might be wrong about this, and he might have a very different game plan set up for this, but I think he might try to play Matador for a bit. And Dos Anjos is a very, very difficult guy to Matador with any degree of efficacy. So I'm going to lean towards Dos Anjos, but that's a really good fight. I'm looking forward to that fight, and that's one of only two fights on the main card I can say that about. So now we get into the heavyweights. Alexi Olyanik will fight Walt Harris in your co-main event. Have these two fought before? I think they have, but I might be mistaken. No, I'm thinking of... I must be thinking of somebody else. Uh, Olenek coming off of that lost Alistair over him. You know, that was not a... For for a heavyweight fight with those two guys, that was a relatively engaging affair. Uh, whereas Harris, coming off of a win over Sergei Spivak, yeah, that was supposed to be him and Volkov. I would have picked. Vol I think I did pick. Yeah, they were, Harris was supposed to fight Alexei Olenek. Uh, Olenek, oh, sorry. Olenek got moved up to fight Overeem after Volkov pulled out of the Overeem fight. I remember that now. And some other guy stepped in to fight Harris on short notice, and uh, Harris kind of blew through him. I mean, I almost hate picking Olenek because it's such a... It's such a weird thing to pick him to win some of these fights. I've picked him in the past. Uh, I mean, I... Uh, I picked him to win, I think, the Jared Rochalt fight, which was one a lot of people did not think he was going to win. I picked him to win that. And he did. But, I, I, I don't know, it's weird picking him in some respects. You know what, I'm going to do it. I might feel stupid, Walt Harris might, you know, turn his lights out, but I'm going to pick Olenek, I don't care. Alright, next up, another heavyweight fight, because God hates me. Um, Greg Hardy. I don't know what we're doing here with this guy. But the UFC is now on ESPN, and it's an event that's held in Texas, so we must have Greg Hardy, I suppose. Um, I mean, he blew through some guy who they brought in specifically to lose. and I mean, let's, let's not mince words about this. Dmitry Smolyakov was brought in to be a punching dummy for Greg Hardy, and he served that purpose. Uh, he's fighting Juan Adams, who had a pretty terrible last fight because Juan Adams has, even by heavyweight standards, 
not so great cardio. But then again, Greg Hardy's cardio sucks out loud too. Um, if I'm Juan Adams, I just make Greg Hardy swing and miss for about a minute and a half, and then he's going to gas. Um, I'm going to pick Adams. I mean, it's not just that I don't like Greg Hardy, but I don't think he's all that good. I think he blo- I think he's a generally athletic enough human being and possesses enough punching power to get through a certain level of opposition. But any time he runs up against actual opposition or can't finish a fight quickly, he tends to fold. Now, that can change. And if he's working hard at it, that, again, these are elements of his game that could be improved. But, I don't know, I'm just I'm going to go with Adams. I mean, his last fight kind of sucked, too, so I, I just... I'm really... If some fight falls out on this card, I'm hoping it's some one of these two in this one. Just, ugh. So, go on with Adams. Next up, James Vick will fight Dan Hooker. I like this fight. Uh, this is a good fight here. Uh, Hooker coming off of that loss to Barboza. Boy, that was a rough one. Um, that was his first loss in the UFC since returning to lightweight. Um, he... Yeah, that, that, law, that broke a five-fight winning streak, I think. Yeah, five. And, you know, James Vick coming off, I think, the Felder fight, yeah? Yeah, losses to Gaethje and Felder. Tough fight. Um, Hooker's a very analytical fighter. And Vick does leave a fair amount of openings for that kind of fighter to capitalize on. But Hooker also gets a little bit of his success from being kind of a longer, rangier guy. And he's not going to be that against James Vick, so... I, it'll be an interesting clash. I'm Logically, I think I should go with Vic. But I don't feel very logical at the moment, so I'm going to go with Dan Hooker. Just I don't know. I don't know why. His knee game's going to be largely neutralized. Eh, screw, I don't know. Screw it. Going with Hooker. Might look stupid, but going with Hooker. This is one of those shows, one of those, like, pick series for me. I'm going to feel, I feel okay kind of making these decisions in the moment because I know kind of where I am and why I'm doing it, but after the fact, I'm going to go, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> um, also at lightweight, Alexander Hernandez will fight Francisco Trinaldo. That's a rough welcome back for Hernandez after fighting Cowboy. Uh, Trinaldo's, a, Trinaldo's a tough old, old war horse, man. Uh, coming off of that win over Evan Dunham. That was a little bit of a while ago, though. Okay, he was supposed to fight earlier, a little earlier this year, but that got cancelled, so okay. Uh, um, if Hernandez is able to consistently get Trinaldo on his back, I think he'll have some success. But that's a tough ask against... I mean, Trinaldo's UFC record is surprisingly good. He's only got, what, five losses in the UFC? Good grief. Those are to Glayson Tebow, Piotr Hallman, Michael Chiesa, Kevin Lee, and James Vick. Yeah, that's a pretty stiff level of opposition. I mean, apart from Hallman, who never really panned out, but... I mean, Tebow, Chiesa, Lee, and Vick... That's that's some top shelf competition. I don't like picking again. I don't like picking against Francisco Trinaldo without a real kind of concrete reason for doing so. And I expect Hernandez to probably have moments of success in this fight, but I think he's gonna come out really pressure things forward, do a lot an obst- mismanage his energy and that'll lead to Trinaldo having more success later. I, I think the old I think the old dog uh, still has a few tricks up his sleeve for this one. And kicking off the main card, we have another heavyweight fight, God help us all. A rematch many years in the making between Andre Arlovsky and Ben Rothwell. Uh, Rothwell, this is his first fight Sorry, he came back from that suspension and lost to Blagoy Ivanov. And Arlovsky shouldn't be fighting. I mean, he's coming off that loss to Augusto Sakai. 
Good grief. Now, Arlovsky's not had a win since he beat Stefan Struve last year. I, uh, yeah, wow. Yeah, I don't think he should be fighting. I mean, certainly not in the UFC with his recent streak. And he's he's not taken as much damage over his last couple of fights, but... I mean, your ability to be competitive isn't actually going to repair your brain. And... I don't know. Again, like, logically, this should be Rothwell. But neither of these guys have looked all that good recently. No, no, I'm going to pick Rothwell. I cannot pick Andre Arlovsky at this point to win a fight. I just can't do it. But don't be surprised if Ben Rothwell looks terrible and Arlovsky picks up a win. That keeps him around for another three fights that he will lose. All right, on the prelims, Alex Caceres fights Steven Peterson. Oh, God. I don't think Steven Peterson should be in the UFC. I mean, his one win was a split decision that probably A, should have gone the other way, and B, was over a guy who shouldn't be in the UFC also. Yeah, I mean, Bissett, yeah, no. Uh, whereas Caceres is, I don't know, he's he's Alex Caceres. He's the same guy, more or less, he's always been. He's made some refinements to his game. I mean, he used to just be like the worst fighter on the roster. That's not him anymore. He probably wins this fight, but eh. He has not looked all that good over his last fights. Uh, split decision loss to Wang Guan. Split decision win over Martin Bravo. Got smoked by Cron Gracie. Just, I don't know, man. I do not know. I, again, he should win this one. Um, Raquel Pennington will miss weight. I just assume. Why is she fighting? I mean, she had a decent run up to her title fight. Got just obliterated by Amanda Nunes. That was a one-sided shellacking and then Mrs. Waite badly in the Durandamy fight she weighed 138 I think uh, yeah 138 and had nothing for Durandamy all fight um, I don't know if she's just fighting out her contract or what but if she has not refound some kind of motivation uh, she's fighting Irina Aldana and Aldana's... And she had a bit of a rough introduction to the UFC, losing to Leslie Smith and Caitlin Chukagian. I kind of remember thinking she won the Chukagian fight, but I might have been wrong. Um, has won three in a row since then. Uh, last seen submitting Betch Kohea after Kohea badly missed weight. Jeez, Kohea weighed 141 for that fight. That was ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I can pick Pennington at this point. Just the way she's looked her last couple of fights, it's not been encouraging. So I'll go with Aldana, but... If Pennington is on her game, I think that's a winnable fight for her. Um, Sam Alvey was supposed to fight somebody else. I think. Really? This was always this fight? Wow. Wow. Okay, Sam Alvey is going to fight Clidson Abreu, who I know nothing about. This leads to one of only, like, two possibilities. Either Sam Alvey, this is a guy way out of his depth, and Sam Alvey will summarily knock him out after an awkward minute and a half or so of fighting. Probably longer, actually. Or he's good, and he... <laughs> and he you know, beat Sam Alvey in a terrible fight because Sam Alvey does not really have watchable fights as a general rule. I'll go with Sam Alvey in the dark here, but, uh... Man, he's on a tough stretch. He's on a two-fight losing streak. He got stopped by Little Nog. <laughs> Who the heck is stopped by Little Nog via strikes in, what was that, 18? Yeah, 2018. Little Nog TKO'd him in the second round. 
Then he got stopped by Jimmy Crute in the first round uh, earlier this year. He needs the win. Uh, Roxanne Modafferi will fight Jennifer Maya. Uh, this is a rematch, actually. These two fought for the Invicta flyweight title uh, a few years ago. 16? Yeah. Uh, Maya won that fight. I think it, it was split at the time. I don't think the split was necessarily warranted, I seem to recall. I th think I had Maya winning that fight. Uh, I have... I think I'll take Maya here as well. I mean, Maya had kind of a rough introduction against Liz Carmouche, but still had some success. Beat Alexis Davis. I mean, Roxanne Modafferi has kind of she's coming off the win over Antonina Shevchenko. You know what? Now I'm gonna go with Maya. Um, at bantamweight, Ray Borg will fight Gabriel Silva. I'll go with Borg in the dark, but I'm. I mean, I, I thought he got got a raw decision in the Casey Kenny fight. Jeez, he missed weight for that fight, too. Yeah, Borg really needs the win. Uh, Mario Batista will fight Jin Su Sun. I think I've I think both of these gentlemen have fought in the UFC before. Uh, Batista six and one. Yeah, he lost to Corey Sandhagen. I remember that. Now that I see that it was Sandhagen. And then Son. Oh yeah, he's that maniac who just got beat, who just got cracked by Peter Yan for three rounds, but just kept smiling and egging him on. Oh, that was such a that was a wild kind of thing to see because Yan abused him, but he wouldn't go down. I'm going with Son there, but might be wrong. And then uh, Domingo Pilarate. Pilearte via Felipe Colares. I think Colares has fought for the U UFC before. Um, yeah, he lost a fight um, to Geraldo de Frietas, whose name I recognize, but I remember nothing of the fight. Whereas Pilarte, again, I think this is his debut. Yeah, he won a contender series fight over Vince Morales. That was a while ago. Yeah, that was a year ago. Jeez. He was supposed to fight Brian Kelleher. I wonder what happened there. I, I need to know who... Okay, he got injured prior to the Kelleher fight. Okay. Um, The UFC tends to matchmake some of these guys coming off the Contender Series in ways they think they can win, so I'll go with Pilarte, but... Uh, I don't know. Again, that that's a bit of a coin flip in that respect. They're two very unknown properties so far as that goes. So, Anyway, that will be UFC on ESPN4 next week. This, uh, sorry, this coming Saturday, the 20th, and I will have coverage of that in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania. So stop by, say hello. As always, I deeply appreciate it. All right, not a ton of news. Oh, Chad Bend has officially announced his retirement from MMA. I mean... This was something that I think a few months ago circulated amongst kind of the journalists that he'd announced that he was done. And now after some time away, he confirmed it. Uh, he doesn't seem to miss it. Uh, I mean, we'll see how long that holds, but... Um, you know, Mendez was a really good fighter. Just unfortunately ran into, you know... <laughs> A couple of guys who just were a little bit better. Uh, I mean, he had one of the best featherweight fights you'll ever see. His second fight with Jose Aldo was an absolute classic. Uh, he just kind of ran into guys like Frankie Edgar, Conor McGregor, Jose Aldo. Um, who was his last one? He had a because he had a really kind of I don't want to say shocking loss, but. He had one that was a little bit unexpected his last... Yeah, Alec, Volkanovski finished him. I picked Volkanovski in that fight, I think. But, yeah, he he seems like he's done, and... You know, again, dude had a very, very good career. I, uh, you know, I don't have any you know, negative wishes for as far as him in retirement, so... 
Good for him. Uh, really light on news. Hang on, let me check here and see what else we might have. You know, yeah, I think I'm going to call that. Um, I think the only other thing that kind of came out was, you know, Jorge Masvidal saying he wants to fight Conor McGregor, and everybody wants to fight Conor. Conor doesn't want to fight. If Conor wants to fight, he'll fight. Like, there's no doubt about that. There is no shortage of options. If he wants to fight, he will. Until then, everybody's just kind of spitting in the wind. Uh, Masvidal and Diaz, if Nate gets by... Who's he fighting? He's fighting Pettis, right? Him and Anthony Pettis coming up. Uh, Nate's a doable fight for him. I think more, uh, probably a bit more realistic than McGregor, and probably about as lucrative, all things considered. So, But anyway, I don't think that's worth really getting into. Uh, let's go ahead and get out of here then. Uh, you can find me this Tuesday. Mark Radulich, Alexis Haina, Jason Teasley, as well as myself, will be reviewing Crawl over on Damn You Hollywood. Uh, it looks stupid, but it looks like my kind of stupid, so... I don't know, we'll see. It's a Sam Raimi movie. You know, I don't know if he's directing it, but he's involved in it, and... That's kind of Sam Raimi... I hate to... I, I don't mean to be disparaging. That's kind of Sam Raimi in a nutshell. There's a little bit of weirdness in stupid, but... Uh, enjoyable. <laughs> it tends to be up my alley, you know, so. I am kind of looking forward to that. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, can be on the lookout for Jeff's San Diego Comic-Con coverage in the zones of 411 Mania. Be back next week to review UFC on ESPN Plus 4, and I think we're previewing uh, the pay-per-view. Yeah, UFC 240. Which is Holloway and Edgar, finally. Um, that's not a... I'd say it's not a bad card. It's a weird card. Again, you have Holloway and Edgar. Great fight. You have Cyborg and Felicia Spencer. Which I'm not quite sure what's... Eh, what's up with that? Then you have Jeff Neal and Nico Price, which is a very fan-friendly affair. Uh, then you have Olivier Oba Merce and Armin Sarukian, which will have some fun wrestling exchanges. And then Mark Andre Barrio versus Christoph Yatko. That's a weird one. Um, elsewhere on that card, Alexis Davis versus Viviane Araujo, Hakim Dawadu, and Yoshinori Hor Um Horie? Hori? I don't know how you pronounce that guy's last name. I apologize. Uh, it should be Yoshinori if I mispronounce that. Uh, Gavin Tucker will fight Young Wu Choi. I think Choi's fought in the UFC before, and Tucker, I know, had some potential. I mean, he hasn't fought since that beating Rick Glenn put up, put uh, on it. Put on him, man. That was that was not a that was not a good fight. He got uh, Glenn abused him. That fight should have been stopped by his corner, if nothing else. Um, we have a flyweight sighting, Alexandre Pantoja and Dievson Figueredo. Good fight, but I feel like the loser's getting cut. Because that's how this thing goes. Then Jillian Robertson and Sarah Froda, Eric Koch, and Kyle Stewart. Uh, there's a lot of the, the pretty typical Canadian contingent here. I mean, they're in Canada, so it makes sense. But uh, we'll have a full preview of that next week. Uh, yeah, I think that's where you can find me. So until then, thank you everyone for listening. Share us with your friends, whatever your platform happens to be. Engage with the content, please, just a little bit. If you think this is a one-star show, give me one star. Uh, just do... It, it helps the algorithm. And the algorithm is going to control our life very, very soon. We all know it's coming. Just make the algorithm happy. Engage with the content a little bit. Nothing... Again, you don't have to go crazy. I don't expect a, you know... a huge review, but a little bit. Give me a, you know, A star. I am I think I'm worth at least one. Okay? One star. Maybe only one, but certainly not negative stars. So, get, again, a review, a like, if at all possible, whatever. Just uh, share us with your friends if they are interested in the sport at all. Deeply appreciated. I will see you all next time. Until then, stay safe out there, and please continue to be well, be safe, and behave.